if you do not understand white supremacy, what it is, and how it works, everything else that you do understand will confuse you. In all of these nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war, anywhere on the planet, minute by minute, day by day, all of the time, all of the time, all of the time. Well, good morning, and welcome to the November the 15th edition of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., also referred to as the CRCS. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby, and we'd like to start off by saying thank you for listening to the program. Thank you very, very much. Appreciate that. Uh, let's see here. We have some we have a, some contact numbers that you can get in contact with the show because we would like for you to join the conversation. The main number is 516-453-9921. And as customary, if you have a question, and I'm going to stress a brief, brief, brief comment, just uh, press the number one button and you will get in line. And when the call screener comes on, please be sure to give them your name, and um, then you'll just get in line. If you are a new caller to the program, just simply tell the call screener that you are a new caller. They will let me know, and I will um, give you the proper introduction, new caller alert, so that you can be heard, so you don't have to worry about not being heard you will be heard, so that will be that will be good. You can also contact me via the Gmail. That is the numeral seven, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at Gmail dot com. And when I get it, I will. I think I'm going to start giving out a symbol, and those that will um, contact me that way, you'll see that uh, I will give you a symbol that will let you know that I have received it and you will go into rotation. You can also uh, contact the show or actually uh, be a part of the show by participating in the chat room, and all you have to do is go to blogtalkradio.com. Then the uh, uh, bar will come up, and then when that bar comes up, just type in... uh, uh, programs, and then you want to scroll down to the Produce Justice Show, hit that, and when you do that, then the chat room becomes available for you, and you can enter into the chat room and get into some good conversations, some good information, and occasionally I will read some of the uh, ongoings in the chat room. I would ask that you <clears throat> do not ask me a question to ask Mr. Fuller via the chat. That is why the number is in, so that you can ask that way. But occasionally I will take something that's being said and may have Mr. Fuller comment on it or whatever. You can do that. So those are the three ways that you can get into the program. We like to say that um, all the material or discussions um, on the show, you can get at ProduceJustice.com, which also includes the books and past shows, including the uh, Carl Nelson show, which we have a link set up for you to hear uh, programs on the uh, Carl Nelson show via our website here at ProduceJustice.com. Okay, I think that might be it for the announcements today. Thank you, Constructive Action Items. Okay. Appreciate that. Okay. So without further ado, um, there's a problem with my phone lines. Hmm. Oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's see. I need to fix my phone lines. We shouldn't have to be on hold for more than 30 minutes. Um, 
Well, that depends, Justice Warrior, because we have so many people that call that call in, and um, and then Mr. Fuller answers the questions, and as you know, he uses examples, and uh, it may take him some time to do that. Appreciate your inquiry on that, but that is why, and that is yeah, that that is why it is anyway. Um, but thank you for that suggestion. Uh, Justice Warrior. Anyway, let me introduce to some and present to others Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. And Mr. Fuller, how are you this morning? I'm still learning. You are still learning. Okay, this segment is the thoughts and expressions um, from the mind of Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr. Mr. Fuller, what is on your mind this morning? I was thinking about Mr. Rodney King some years ago, back in the early 1990s. And uh, just before he passed away, uh, which was shortly after what you call the Rodney King incident, the Los Angeles riots and all like that, uh, it's something that's kind of written, I would say, in the history books. Uh, And something he said, I was thinking about another king, uh, Dr. Martin Luther King. Where do we go from here? And that was the title of his last book, I think, if I have it correctly. Where do we go from here? And Mr. Rodney King's question was, can we all get along? So all problems are solved in the process of questions and answers. Where do we go from here? Can we get along? Can we all get along? Where do we go from here? Now, Dr. Martin Luther King wrote that book shortly before he passed, which was in 1968, Mr. Rodney King was in the 1990s when he made his question, put forth his question to the world. Can we all just get along? Is there any way to do that? I mean, he said, but we're stuck here for a while. Say, can we all just get along? I mean, all of this, you know, confusion and chaos, and, and a lot of people said that Mr. Rodney King was a person who was kind of delirious. But that's a logical question. Is it possible for we, we people on this planet, well, we keep here in the preamble to the Constitution, we the people, well, we the people, can we all get, just get along? Where do we go from here? These are questions. And people listen to it and say, yeah, that came from Martin Luther King, uh, you know, where do we go from here? Yeah, Rodney, that guy Rodney King, he did say that. Then we all just get along. And so what happens, or what has happened since then, it's just like nothing has changed. Got as much gunfire out here as ever. And then overseas among white people, you got whole cities being destroyed, and they halfway build them back up again every two or three months, start patching this up, patching that up, and start firing guns and blowing, all, blowing them all up again. 
It's an old song that's got a, uh, a line in it. I get weary and sick of trying. Tired of living, scared of dying. The old man river just keeps on rolling along. So when I come on air like this, it's a serious business. It's not playtime at all. No kind of plan. How can anybody even smile? With all this nonsense going on, we've gotten so used to it, that's why. And we've become animals. Some of the worst of the animals. Worse than animals. Black people and white people. Just as crazy as we can be. All you got to do is just turn on the television. Look at all this foolishness. I don't care what kind of channel you flip. People are laughing in the middle of a whole bunch of carnage. If that's not insane, I don't know what is. Twelve people in the shooting today. Fifteen over here. A hundred and twelve over here. Can't even walk down the street. Go to the grocery store. Elderly people dodging bullets. Falling down with the grocery falling all out of their arms and all over the parking lot. And we dancing and cooning. White people walking by and like, you know, well, you know, uh, let's uh, come up with another phrasing, fighting. Just prior to the football game. Then get on the football field and fight. Got majorettes and got the band playing, all kind of battle tunes. Waving flags. Insanity. Mass insanity. And we have no idea of how crazy we are. Sophisticated crazy. I'm talking about people who are supposed to be great leaders and all like that, stepping forward, taking bows, being praised, everybody hand clapping. And bodies stacking up, I mean, so that you have to park them out in the parking lot. Can we all just get along? Can we all just get along? Get across the parking lot without getting killed by somebody who just decides to run over you. And that's routine. And that's what I'm thinking about. I don't know what other people are thinking about. But I think all of our thoughts should be from a, a couple of people named King, Martin Luther King, where do we go from here? And can we all just get along? Hmm. Can we all? That's just all I got to say right now. Get along. Okay. That's fine. That's fine, Mr. Fuller. 516 453 9921. You are listening. To the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller. I am your co host, Mr. Bobby. Let's go to the G mails before we take the uh, phone calls. This comes from Glenna. She wrote it last week, but um, I did give you a mention at the end of last week's program, Mr. Fuller. So here it is again. It says, Good morning, Mr. Fuller. And uh, she indicated, Did you hear, Mr. Fuller, about an event? Uh, this past week in Washington, D.C., called the Rally for Reparations, in which black people gathered to rally for reparations. If so or not, what do you think about this approach? Well, the code calls for me not to make any kind of criticism of any type of feeble efforts, and most black people's efforts are feeble. 
in the system of white supremacy. To change what is into what should be. A world in which everybody gets the help that they need that is of constructive value and that nobody is mistreated in the process. There is a word for it called justice. So anybody anywhere, the code requires me to only say that they are doing what they are doing. That's why we need a code where, we, you know, if black people, no matter how humble, their efforts are, or whether I agree with them or not, or the style that they choose. If they're trying, if a black person anywhere on the planet is trying to do something that's just halfway constructive, particularly when it comes to race, racism, or counter-racism, I am, at the most, only allowed to say, well, they're doing what they're doing. Now, if you ask me about evaluating what they're doing, I'm supposed to repeat that same line. They're doing what they're doing. I'm not going to evaluate that. Why? I haven't solved the race problem. Neely Fuller, that's your job, solving the race problem. You haven't done it. So don't you dare open your mouth, Neely Fuller, and say anything against anybody who's trying to do what they think will help solve the race problem. That sounds like those people were trying to do something to help solve the race problem. They said reparations, repair. You don't repair something unless it's broken. So, yeah, just about everything when it came comes to interaction between people, you can't name anything. It can't stand improvement. Can we all just get along? Everything is broken. People can't even speak to each other without a fight starting. Oh, I mean, you can say anything. Say good morning to somebody. I mean, on an elevator. I mean, a fight. You know, it might be gunfire before the elevator meets, uh, gets to the next floor. Like I say, mass insanity. And we've been that way for so long, we don't even see it. We think this is wonderful. Or normal. And it is normal. Meaning, you can expect it. So in answer to that question, they're doing what they're doing. And neither poor. Ain't got no qualifications for making any kind of criticism. Because at least they're trying to do something, no matter how ragged it might be. And I'll use the cliche saying that I said, I told people this years ago, I said, with a whole lot of things that are told you every day, or a whole lot of things that you see, and you shake your head because it seems so pitiful, like some black person who is just walking around saying that Jesus saves and begging for quarters. Give me a quarter in the name of Jesus. And you know the person goes to the liquor store the minute they get that quarter. Don't laugh and don't shake your head. This is the kind of world that we have in the system of white supremacy. So anybody who is making any kind of effort to do anything that's just a little bit sane, whether they're white or non-white, just a little bit constructive, as long as they're doing it, leave it alone. Don't Mm -hmm. criticize it. Because there's so many millions of people who have a whole lot of so-called intelligence. 
or who was sitting around in huge rooms wearing fancy suits who were talking about what? How to kill somebody. This is the war room. All you peaceful people stay out. That's going on right now. Where? All over the world. Right down to the gang around there in the alley. Who's fixing to carjack somebody. That's mm-hmm. war room. That type of mentality. So anybody who's trying to do anything, clean up the environment, whatever, picking up cans, don't criticize it. Okay. All righty. From the chat room, uh, it has been mentioned by Justice Warrior that the rally for reparations event in D.C. last weekend was a very constructive event full of people who are supporters of Mr. Fuller and wouldn't have had him, would have had him speaking there if that was something Mr. Fuller was ever in, interested in doing again. Okay. All righty. All righty. Okay, let's go to the phone lines. And we will go to Milwaukee and Corey. You are there. Get ready. I'm going to uh, see if I can get you in here. Okay, Corey. Let's see here. We're buffering. Okay, you're on. Go ahead, Corey. Good morning. Good morning, uh, Mr. Bobby and Mr. Fuller. Um, I, I was referring to uh, page 64 of the Word Guide. Um, the Word is... Uh, Compensatory Communication Associate. Um, it says that use this word to apply to any person with whom you or others talk to, receive information from, give information to, or engage in activity with for the purpose of helping to produce justice and or for the purpose of helping to end racism, white supremacy, according to a compensatory and or codified method of thinking speaking, and or acting. Um, Mr. Fuller, um, I had a a white individual who I would consider a compensatory communications associate um, recently tell me that um, a victim of racism, a black person living amongst white people, he feels that the white people should be and I'm quoting him now, bending over backwards at the chance to reconcile and work towards healing and ending racism. And those who truly yearn for justice should do everything they can, but those who hide from the production of justice should receive their reward. And he goes on to say, the hell that they produce awaits them. I wanted to ask you, Mr. Fuller, what do you think of this? Well, I'm not too sure you said so much there. Uh, okay. I'm trying to get to the epicenter of what's being said. Uh, okay. A white person is having a problem in his or her interaction with black people and talking about racism. Is that the picture? No, it's um, basically a white person expressing to me, a non-white person, that he feels white people should be doing everything they can to try to work towards ending racism, and he doesn't see it happening at all. Yes. Okay, he's making a statement. So the question to me is what? Do you agree with this? Yeah, I don't see it happening. See, it's either either you do it or you ha- uh racism, according to the code, you either have it or you don't. No such thing as in between. You either have a system of white supremacy or you don't. And that's it. 
I mean, you don't have to go around and say, well, now this and that and the other and when. You either have it or you don't. And as long as you have it, you have it. No such thing as degrees of racism. Well, now, I checked yesterday, and it looks like it's getting a little better. No, we need to get out of that altogether. Is it gone? That's the only question. And, and if it's not gone, it's just like starting all over again from when it started, the first minute that it started. This thing called racism and all white supremacy. That's the code position. I mean, in a slang term, you might say, don't take no prisoners on that. You can't say, well, it's a little better than it was in 1622. Hey, 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 stop it. Don't say nothing else about that. Is it in existence this minute? And if the answer is yes, then it means it's just like starting from scratch. It's just like nothing has happened the whole time that the first person that thought about being a racist thought about being a racist. That's how you measure it. You don't measure it by any other measuring stick. According to what? According to counter-racist lo- uh, logic in the year 2022, which is where we are now. It's just like nobody ever lifted a finger. Every morning that you get up, there's been zero progress because racism is so poisonous. It's no, like cancer. It's, it's no such thing as a little bit of it. You either got it or you haven't. And we need to learn that here in 2022. All righty. Thank you, Corey. Thank you for your um, inquiry. Let's take a station break here. You are listening to the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. And we thank you here all at ProduceJustice.com. If you would like to be a participant in today's conversation, whatever question you have, just simply dial 516-453-9921. Press the number one button if you have a question or a comment, or you can just listen to the show, as many people have done. You can do that. You can also Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby B O B B Y at gmail.com. And when I get it, I will give you a symbol that I'm going to start using now that will let you know that I have your Gmail and that it will be read at, at some time. I don't know when, but it will be read. You know, you can also join or be a participant in the chat room. All you have to do is go to blogtalkradio.com. And you want to make sure that you click on where it says program. And when you do, uh, you'll come up on the uh, Produce Justice show. So you want to click on that. And then click where it says chat. And then you are in the chat room. And there are good conversations going on in there. I was looking for a review from Constructive Actions items for last week. But I didn't get that. But that's okay. But there are good conversations in there, and you might pick up uh, something. As a matter of fact, one of um, the statements was made by Still Learning, too, uh, in response to what you were talking about when you opened up the show, Mr. Fuller. It says, has anyone ever provided a response to Rodney King's question, can't we all just get along? If not... Who should? Good question. Have you heard anybody respond to that, Mr. Fuller? No. Okay. I, I haven't heard anybody give a codified plan, because that's what, that's what the code says. We need plans. We need plans, not just slogans. We need plans to what Martin Luther King said. 
Rodney King said, can we all just get along? Dr. Martin Luther King said, his last book was, where do we go from here? I have heard on all these years. He was killed in 1968. Mm-hmm. In all these years. How many people have really said, well, I got the plan, the plan, not just something thrown together, I mean, a bunch of slogans about, well, we will rise above it all. That's nice. Slogans are nice, but I've said on this program and other programs, and I've said according to logic, logic says that Slogans are fine, but slogans are like titles of books. I have a book with a title, in fact, several titles on the cover. But suppose you bought the book and opened the book after reading the title, textbook, workbook for victims of white supremacy, and it's got almost 500 pages. But in the book, every page is blank. Now, black people got a whole bunch of slogans. Black Lives Matter, you name it. We got the slogans. But a slogan is like a title of a book. They do serve a purpose. I mean, if you walk through a library and there's no titles on the books, my goodness, you'd be in there forever just trying to find anything that you were looking for. So books should have titles, and the titles should be prominent on the covers of the book. And that's what slogans are. They're the leading you to problem solving, all right, one way or another. All books are directly and indirectly, either for better or for worse, because there's two ways to solve problems, the correct way in the incorrect way. So even in a detective novel or a murder story, well, you wrote a book about murder, so you say what? When you turn a few pages, you find out that they got a detective in there named Dan Hatfield, and this detective is going to try to do what? Solve, 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 the murder. Well, they really don't need much of any of those books. Mm -hmm. But maybe you can learn a little bit something since people do murder each other and you do try to find out who did it. But somehow, down through the years, getting back to the race issue, and books about the race issue. The books contain basically just one slogan after another. You never get through the page that tells you what to do about anything. It's just more slogans, more book titles. Or someone talking about at great length how they feel about something. Not what you do about the something, the problem, doing about the problem, but how to feel about the problem. Now, this next page will make you sad. Well, you're already sad. That's why you bought the book in the first place. You're trying to get rid of that sadness. Or should be. According to what? According to logic, that's what. Okay, according to logic. All righty. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Fuller. Let's go to Toronto, Canada, I believe, and that's George. George, get ready. Let me see if I can tune you in here. Okay. 
Okay, George, you're on with Mr. Fuller. Good morning. Oh, hi, Mr. Bobby. Hi, Mr. Fuller. Um, I'm just um, experiencing uh, a lot of racial dislocation. Um, I tried to get my job back, and the the white supremacists decided that they're not going to allow me to have my job back. So since I'm a victim of racism, all I could do is make requests to the white supremacists And that's what I continue to be doing. So they said that they have laws that say that um, um, everyone has the right to uh, due process and equal protection under the law. But I've spoken to the white supremacists. I've made uh, my I've made my reports, and um, you know they still send me around in circles. So I was just wanting to. uh, Ask Mr. Fuller is um, what else can I do? I mean, I I try to use logic, and I create my codes, but I still get keeps getting sent around in circles. Mm-hmm. Okay, all right. So you want to, what Mr. Fuller to answer? What else can you do, Mr. Fuller? Uh, he's asking what else can he do? Spread out his request. That's all any of us can do. That's all I did. That's all I've done all my life. I'm in the system of white supremacy. I tell, I've told people, well, 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 what is your basic title? Or what are you this? I say, I don't have but one title that counts. Victim of white supremacy. That's the only title I've ever had. And a lot of black people have said, oh, man, I mean, come on. I mean, you know, you, you, you know. You said you was in the Army. Did you have a title there? Was you a sergeant? Yeah, I was a sergeant. I wasn't no officer, nothing like that. Well, I mean, what rank were you and all like that? Well, you know, uh, have you ever taught school? Well, I've been to school, you know, lots of schools and whatnot, uh, training mostly by the military. Uh, You know, every black person got a a whole bunch of titles, if you want to use them. But in answer to the question, you keep right on keeping on. Confucius said, and I've said this on the, on this show, on this presentation. Confucius, if I saw it correctly, said, move slowly. If that's the only way you can move, but don't stop. And then there's another illustration of the same philosophy by Memphis Slim, a blues singer back in the 1950s. As you go through life, you can't help knowing. You can always get help. But only the way you're going. If you want to go into the cocaine business, you just keep plugging. Just keep on. You don't know this. you don't know cocaine from talcum powder. But you want to go into cocaine business, you start spreading it around. In other words, you start telling people, asking people. You know, some guys around here dealing drugs, man. I ain't dealing no drugs. I don't even go out. Well, how do you go about doing that? Who do they contact? What's the first step? If you keep going in that direction, next thing you know, you're going to be dealing drugs. Mm-hmm. That's what Memphis Slim meant. As you go through life, you can't help knowing. You can always get help. Only the way you're going. So in answer to your question, you just keep asking. Like Andrew the Frame in the movie Shawshank Redemption. He said, I'm going to start trying to get money from the state to build a library. And so the warden totally laughed at him and said, you can have, you can write all the letters you want. But the only response you're going to get is but the only thing they're going to give you money for in this prison is more guards, more bars, 
some more walls. In mm-hmm. other words, strengthen this prison that way. Ain't going to give you no money for no library for these dunda heads. Mm-hmm. But Andy said, I'm going to keep trying. I'm going to see mm-hmm. if I can do it. And so mm-hmm. finally he did it. Okay? And there's all kinds of illustrations of that. You know? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah. Keep on keeping on. And not just ask the people that you where you are. Spread yourself out. Ask mm-hmm. people in other places. But don't turn loose to ask them where you are because you can tell them that always emphasize that you are trying to obey the Constitution. If they keep saying, well, we're not going to give you your job back, you say, but the Constitution requires that I continue, that I don't give up. Like that's what the football games, the playing of the national anthem in the Northwestern Hemisphere is supposed to be all about. I mean, that's what the Star Spangled Banner is supposed to be all about. Allegiance to the flag is what it's supposed to be all about. Mm. It's supposed to be about the Constitution of the United States. And Mm -hmm. they'll say, well, what's that got to do? They're going to ask you, what's that got to do with this job? And you'll say everything. The Constitution has to do with everything. And I'm supposed to support and defend the Constitution. And the only way I can do that on this job is to be on the job and not to allow anyone to force me off the job, which means they're forcing me away from supporting and defending the Constitution. That should Mm -hmm. be your basic approach because you ain't got nothing else going for you. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. All right. And everywhere you go, stick that Constitution out there particularly the, the Fourth, uh, Fourteenth, and the Fifth Amendment. Those two. Those yes, two. Fifth Amendment and the Fourteenth. Now, the Fifth Amendment is about what? And this doesn't apply to people all over the world, but in the Northwestern Hemisphere that comes under the Constitution, which is where I think you are, this is what you use in any type of setting. Fifth and Fourteenth Amendments of the Constitution. The Fifth Amendment is about what? Going to the due process. In other words, going, taking into consideration every detail of everything, going back over and over again, all right, and making sure there are no mistakes that were made in your dismissal. That's what they call it due process. You might go over it 15 times. And they say, well, that's enough. And they say, well, not if the Constitution is being violated and there's still some questions that haven't been answered. So let's go over it again and again and again. All right. Fourteenth Amendment is about equal protection. It's everybody who ever had this job fired for the same reasons. So you've got to make a lot of comparisons. Mm-hmm. Otherwise, the 14th Amendment is being violated because you're supposed to have equal protection under the law. Everybody, if you treated one person one way, can't treat somebody else another way. Not if the same thing happened in the same process. If you treated a white person 50 years ago, and the law didn't change, different from a black person that was treated on the same circumstances this morning. Got to take that into consideration. They say, well, that was 50 years ago. Yeah, well, did, did the Constitution change? Did the 14th Amendment become abolished? Well, no. <laughs> That's a precedent. They call it case law. That's what they call it, case law. Mm-hmm. Meaning case we law. got an example here of another person under the same circumstances who was not terminated. Now, what about that? They say that was 2,000 years ago. I don't care how long it was ago. The law is the same. 
That's why we need a code. So it stays the same until mm-hmm. you have to change it on the kind of conditions have changed. And then you let everybody know what those conditions are and why the changes were made. And you do that very slowly. Yes, and sir. then the Supreme Court Justice will tell you. All righty now. All righty. Thank you very much, Mr. Fuller. Thank you very much. Yeah. Your applause on that one. <laughs> All righty. Um, for those who were um, interested, constructive action items want to re- a review for our last week. Thank you, constructive action items. And it starts off by this. Number one, this is from last week, November the 8th, 2022. Tell yourselves the truth at all times. Number two, a a quality relationship requires that both parties be equal in that relationship. No one has the power over the other person. Number three, constructive contact only. Solve a problem or leave the interaction. Number four, remember the four basic questions. What do you want to do? Why do you want to do it? How do you plan to do it? And what is the expected constructive result? Number five, always do the most constructive thing you can do to become smarter, more effective with your time and energy, and solve problems without making additional problems. Number six, stop focusing on the, quote, failures and flaws, end of quote, of non-white people. Keep your focus on racist man and racist woman. The cause of the failures and flaws of all people on this planet. And number seven, reveal the truth and produce justice and correctness. Thank you, constructive action items. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Mr. Fuller, this is the time that we set aside to for you to speak about your book. So have at it. Now, all these things are the things you just read off are in the textbook for victims of white supremacy. Uh, supposed to tell you what to do to solve problems. It's supposed to be there in the book. I mean, that's what the whole book is supposed to be about. What do you do when this happens? What do you do when that happens? Even in one-on-one relationships, male-female relationships, what do you do? What do you don't do at all times under any circumstances? Okay, and you can get the book by going to producejustice.com. Uh and that's just a simple way of putting it. What, what's the book for? Well, the book is for solving problems and how to do them and when to do them. And, you know, when you start, when you got find out that you got a problem. I mean, one that's addressed to you, not just addressing the race problem in general. No. Anytime you are doing anything, constructive, and the book is supposed to be about what to do that's constructive and what's non-constructive, so you make the least bit number of mistakes in what you're doing, what, how to go about it, in solving problems, you are dismantling the system of white supremacy if you're black and you are solving problems. I'm going to repeat that again. You are dismantling. You are tearing the system of white supremacy apart. If you have black skin, but the moves that you make are always constructive and not non-constructive. Problem solving, not problem making. If you are constructively solving problems and you have black and or non-white skin, but you are constructively solving problems, you are sabotaging 
system of white supremacy to the nth degree. It doesn't get no better than that. That's all you got to do. This thing that I'm doing, is this constructive? Just ask yourself that. Whatever it is you're doing, any time of day or night, wherever you are, and that's what every non-white person, every black person, should constantly ask yourself, wherever you happen to be. Say, well, wait a minute. Look at me. I'm, I'm out tonight. All right. I do go out at night. And what am I doing right now since I'm out? Am I doing something constructive or am I doing something non-constructive? Am I making a problem or am I solving a problem? There's no wiggle room there. Just ask yourself that. You don't have to ask nobody else. And that's what every non-white person on the planet should be doing 24-7. Am I making a problem? Or am I solving one? Am I doing something constructive? Or am I doing something that is non-constructive? And if you're doing something non-constructive, stop doing it and do something that is constructive. Yes, sir. And you'll be doing everything that's required that the code book is about. And the book, code book is supposed to help you in the, not stay in the constructive lane. You can get it by ProduceJustice.com. Okay. And when it's addressed to the individual person, what you do each and every day, how you talk to people, and how you respond when they talk to you. Okay. Like white people, non-white people, any kind of people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. ProduceJustice.com is where you can uh, get the um, get the book and a lot of other information um, that is on there. Okay, uh, back to the – oh, yeah, yeah, this is the number that you can call. And phone lines are open. Okay, got a clear one today. Uh, call this number if you'd like, if you have a question or a brief comment. Please don't abuse that. <laughs> Please do not abuse that. Uh, 516-453-9921. And the lines are clear. Let's go to, I think that it. <laughs> Let's go to the Gmails here. This comes from Dale, Mr. Fuller. He says this, Mr. Fuller, can you explain why when a so-called white person does something of constructive value, they should at all times be accompanied by at least three non-white people, referred to on pages 51 and 50 of the 2016 edition. What is the purpose of that, and why is it required? Thanks. Well, it's just something, everything in the code book is optional, all right? So this is a suggestion. Since a lot of white people say, you black people are always complaining about white people doing this and doing that, and but, but you don't have any ideas of telling us about how to proceed, even in how to talk to you. You don't tell us nothing. You just say, we're bad people. Well, white people mistreating me. But do you have any suggestions about how to make it better? White people ask that. And black people say, well, I, I, you know what to do. And you just be might. You might be, and I've seen it. That's what black people do. Why? Because we have we don't have an idea of how to proceed, but it's un- understandable. So what does the code say about that? The code says, well, black people just do the best they can. Like Neely Fuller is writing a book with a bunch of suggestions. 
Now, if white people don't like what he wrote, then they say here on page 67 or whatever it is, a white person can step forward, which they have never done. No white person has ever done that in interaction with me. Ask me about anything. Okay. So, but I'm saying if a white person has a complaint about what I'm trying to do, make the complaint. And then also, now this is that thing about complaining. Anytime you complain about anything, have a suggestion ready about something better to do. Otherwise, be cautious about making a complaint. It doesn't say don't make a complaint. But in fact, the code says never make a complaint. Make a report. Report something that's happening that shouldn't be happening. And then make a suggestion about what to do about it. Or ask for the people who are supposed to be smarter than you for a suggestion about what to do about it or what they can do about it, the person who is smarter than you. Because the smartest person is always the person who is supposed to be solving the problem. Remember that. That's part of the code. The smartest person, and a lot of people like to brag about how smart they are. Oh, you're the smartest person out of the 9,000 people in this stadium? You said you're the smartest person? Oh, well, <laughs> now, okay. And you can go silent. And if they say, well, why is everybody so quiet now? So we're waiting on you to solve the problem. <laughs> the smartest person is supposed to be the person who has solved the problem, not a person who's trying. Mm-hmm. That's cold. I mean, that's rock solid cold. All right. A lot of well, white people always talk about how many credentials they got for solving a problem. But you're saying credentials? Talking about credibility and problem solving? And you haven't <laughs> solved the problem? Say, well, I'm working on it. Well, you know, everybody can say that. <laughs> everybody oh, says I'm working on it. <laughs> Hmm. All righty. Well, we have come to the conclusion of the first hour of the Counter Racist Code show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. And I would like to, or we would like to thank you for your listenership. We'd like to also thank you for your calls and hope that you continue. Now, if you have to go, we hope that you can come back next week. But for those of you who are going to stay, We have a full hour, a full hour to go on the Counter Racist Culture with Mr. Neely Fuller. Let me remind you, when you call that 516-453-9921 number, please be sure to give your uh, name to the call screener. The person in the prefix 586 has not, so I don't know your name, but when we commence on the... um, second hour, I'm going to come to you, so hopefully somebody will get your name in there so I can give you the proper introduction. We can do that. Okay, Mr. Fuller, we have about 50 seconds, so what's your final word as we close out this first hour? Get the book. That'll be a start in any problem that you have. And uh, most of the things in different ways have been said by people who have written other books. Uh, Sometimes people have called, talked to me and said, well, uh, what about uh, religion? I say, do you have a religious book? Well, if a religious book will help you to solve problems, use that one. That's a part of the code. Mm -hmm. The code is about anything. You know, an instruction guide for your new car that you just got. Yes, sir. 
I mean, it tells you how to solve a problem. It'll say, you know, troubleshoot or something like that. I don't particularly care for that type of language. Yeah. Okay. Of, but in the system of white supremacy, just about it. If you notice, just about everything, even if you're going to solve a problem, they'll call it troubleshooting. <laughs> okay. You know, that's an excuse to talk about what? Guns. <laughs> Sell guns. Yeah. Yeah, guns shoot. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, Mr. Fuller. That concludes the first hour. Stay tuned for the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr., which will commence in five seconds. All righty. Welcome back to the second hour of the Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Nelly Fuller, Jr. I am your co-host, Mr. Bobby. To get in contact with the program, to speak with Mr. Fuller, or if you have a VGQ, this number is available for you as Leona did. Thank you, Leona. Call this number, 516-453-9921, and press the number one button if you have a question or comment. But you can also use that number just to listen to the program, see how it's like, you know, check it out. You can do that. You can also Gmail me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby, B O B B Y, at gmail.com, and then I will give you a, a symbol that I have received that Gmail, and it will be read at a certain period of time, particularly when we have, when the phone lines are not so busy. And we do have a few lines that are open, so you can call in. Yeah, we can get you in there. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, And uh, you can also join the chat room. All you have to do is go to blogtalkradio.com, and you want to make sure that you uh, click on, I believe it's shows, and it's the uh, uh, other programs, and you want to get the Produce Justice show. You get that, click on that, and then there's a little space, and I believe it's at the right-hand side, where you can get into the chat room, and they have some interesting conversations in there. And if you go back uh, in it, you can see the uh, what Constructive Action Items has uh, produced for last week's show to get a, 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 a view of what's going on. And maybe uh, maybe some help in constructing your questions. They do have questions in there and comments, and occasionally I will read one of those comments, as we did today when Mr. Fuller talked about Rodney King and that famous phrase, can we all get along? And someone asked about, well, has there been a response to that? So occasionally you can do that. But check that out and see how you like it, or if you just want to listen or just view the comments. You can. You can do that. Okay. The hand is up in the back of the classroom. Moving to the front, we have Leona. Leona, get ready because I'm going to cue you in, and you are in. Good morning, Leona, and what is your question for Mr. Fuller? Uh, Good morning, uh, Mr. Fuller. Good morning, Mr. Bobby. Uh, Mr. Fuller, my question, sir, is... um, Listen, recently I just saw uh, an ad, get, uh, an insurance company. I won't mention the name. But they show that basketball star, LeBron James. Uh, now, this man is 6 feet 9 inches tall, three, two, no, 250 pounds, 37 years old, professional basketball player. There's a picture of him standing in a gym with a long, straight a wig on, brown hair, long, straight, shoulder-length brown hair. A ribbon across the the top of the of the um, wig. He's holding a basketball. He has on a, a long t-shirt. T-shirt goes all the way down to his calves, and he's standing there looking like a, a twelve-year-old girl in a way. If you can imagine a six-foot-nine-inch man, male, two hundred fifty pounds, looking like a twelve-year-old girl with a with a with a wig on. His beard. Mustache, all that's intact. Now, now uh, I remember listening to a audio of you talking one time 
Uh, well, well, Dr. Francis Kress well, Walsing was quoting you about per, your prediction that uh, the system of white supremacy was going to have, you know, black men in dresses. Now, this is, I guess, over maybe 27 years ago when you made this prediction. But my my my, my question is, sir, um, what what do you this the system of racism, white supremacy? Uh, why did it seems like it finds it necessary to keep black males out of a of an assertive masculine role, and uh, this picture of LeBron James is insulting to little girls, to me, to women. You, know, it's really never mind. My, my question is, um, what 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 do we do about this? You know, why or, or what what do we do about this? What's what's coming up next? Why this system insists on black men not being men? And, and, First and, thing, according to the code, in answer to the question, is you point out that this is a key part of the white supremacist system to maintain and refine and expand and make stronger. I just underline that. To make stronger, to make stronger the system of white supremacy. They are dependent heavily on that to demasculinize black males, every last one of the black males, except for the ones that they want to leave in what you call the brute King Kong category. See, if you're masculine, you're going to be King Kong. They got about 12 different varieties of movies that they just keep showing over and over again. You can look at those movies. It's not on my list. But they got plenty of them. Going way back to Faye Ray, I believe, this white woman, I mean, who was so uh, you know, oh, tender and beautiful and exotic and, oh, uh, just desirable to the nth degree by this big savage ape, which is what the black male is supposed to be. If he's not going to be effeminate, if he's not going to be in drag, then his other option is to be some type of wild animal. And the top, most popular image of the wild animal for a black male is the ape image. King Kong, stepping on cars and tearing up buildings, not being constructive at all, knocking airplanes out of the sky, Ugh. and being motivated to do all this destruction by what? Lust. Lust for what? A white woman. Now you can be that. And they got to put chains on you to hold you down to keep you from chasing down that white woman and stepping on the cars all the way and destroying cities. Or, if you don't want to be that, and you're a black male anywhere on the planet, You can put on your mother's high heel shoes and lead the rainbow. And they will drench you with money and any other enticement that you want. That is obvious to anybody who got eyes to see, or even if they're blind, if they got ears to hear. That this is what black males are doing. Many people are saying that ain't so. When it is just as obvious as anything can be. And, and to me, it is so obvious that it's phenomenal that any black person will be scratching their heads trying to figure out why is this. Or even noticing it. And that's what I have noticed. That a lot of black people I've talked to have said, Oh, I never thought 
thought about this, what they're doing. I never thought about it that way. Good God. I mean, have you, I got, I mean, they, they insist on it when you walk on the, in the door. Don't come in here looking like a masculine black person. Come in here looking like you're ready to do something that makes sense. Either come in here looking like a wild animal, that's acceptable. Get on the bus looking like, I mean, to scare everybody off the bus the way you look. You got to look like a wild animal some kind of way. You don't have to be big. I mean, you just, just be a black male. Look like an animal. I mean, put something on. I mean, some rags all around your head and whatnot. And, and uh, uh, carry a whole bunch of stuff in your arms and look like there's something threatening. Some type of spike belt on it or something, and look ominous. And uh, anything black is supposed to be a dark, supposed to be ominous. All right, but just just look like you're threatening. That you're something that needs to be caged, something that needs to be in a cage, never let out of a cage. You can go that route if you're a black male anywhere on the planet. Don't look like you're going to, a black male going to do anything of constructive value. Now, if you don't want to look like some wild animal, and we'll even gear what we call the popular look, so that you, even if you're a professor, when people see you for the first time, you look like an animal. When you walk into a classroom and you've got a black professor, that black professor is supposed to I mean, your first reaction is, it looks like an animal. Why has he got on all that stuff? Because it makes him look like a wild animal. If you've never seen a certain type of wild animal before, I mean, look like something strange, something that you're not going to run to, you're going to run from. If you see it coming down the street at midnight. Mm -hmm. All right. Mm -hmm. We don't even see that that's what they're doing. And they pay well for it. And we call it, we've gotten to the place we call it a part of our culture. Now, that's image number one, wild animal. But they prefer you to be the image number two. They prefer number two to be number one, rather than have the wild animal image, the King Kong image. No, if you're black and you're male, Try to be as feminine, effeminate as you possibly can be. Dress that way. Look that way. Put on 50 earrings. I mean, just anything that may be, maybe people, when they see you off distance, they get the impression that that's a female coming toward me. And put on anything, you know, put some eyeshadow on and put some, Lipstick on. Be a female. Try to upstage your sisters so they think your sisters are the males and that you are the female in the family. Mm. Learn to talk that way. And want mm. somebody to pat you on the rear. Even if you're a football player, pat my rear. I'm going to mm. bend over. That's what the mm. black male is supposed to be in the system of white supremacy. And many of us think it's funny. No, that's and not think, funny. Not only think it's funny, we think it's desirable. That that's the best that you can be. You have now reached the top of everything. You don't be no, have to be nothing else. Mm. In a feminist black male, you have reached your goal. And if you got to take the number two spot, it's the King Kong spot. That's the run-up. Now, what else you got? Nothing. Now, I'm telling the truth. This is it. Yes. you got no other choices if you want to be in the, quote, unquote, big money. If you mm. want to be successful. 
That's the image of the black male in 2022. Now work on it if you want that image. Because that's where the money is. That's, that's where, where the money. all of the affection is. That's where the white woman don't even have to be a, afraid of you no more. You ain't got no Emmett Till situation with that. Why? Because Mr. Milam, Emmett Till is coming down to Chicago, but he's wearing high heels. So you don't have to worry about him chasing after your wife. You don't have to worry about him chasing after you. And you'll think that's funny. Huh. Oh, wow. Okay. Hmm. Outstanding, outstanding, outstanding. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. And thank you, Leona. Well, you didn't have a problem on that bad boy. Wow. Uh, let's see here. From the uh, chat room, an interesting to the brother that was in uh, Toronto that called, and Mr. Fuller gave you some advice. Here's um, something that has been written. Uh, I guess it was still too still learning. He said, when I was younger, I was terminated from a job based on a lie. The company told me that I disclose confidential information of an ongoing HR investigation since I was given a verbal non-disclosure agreement. A non-disclosure agreement is always in writing, and I was never given any type of NDA. The company just used that as a means of, for walking me out and hoping I turn violent. The company stays its event because I had complained to a government agency, OSHA, after I refused to accept the company's offer of $10,000, OSHA closed my case. In hindsight, OSHA had no intention to harm the corporation that I was employed. If I had the resources then, I would have filed a civil lawsuit against the company and spread it out, as Mr. Fuller suggested. Wow. I use that incident as a teachable moment and to stay in the constructive lane. Wow. Wow. Teachable moment. That's what they do. You notice the word corporation was used. If you have time, look up what the United States really is, and you will find that the United States or so-called United States is a corporation or incorporated. It's not mind-blowing to me, but the usual suspects are in play. New caller alert. New caller alert. Get ready. Delvon from Tampa, Florida is in the house. Let me see if I can include, include you in Del Vaughn. At least that's what it has here. Wait a minute. Okay, Del Vaughn, you're on with Mr. Fuller. What is your question? Okay, I'm here. Yeah, I've been listening to Mr. Fuller for years, you know, ever since I read uh, the book, The Ice Cream Station, by Francis Chris Wilson. And uh, you got to read the preface in order to get the information about Mr. Fuller, you know, being her mentor and so on. So I read the book multiple times, but I never read the preface. So then I read the preface, and I'm like, aha. So I ended up finding both the Nelly Fuller's books and the Word Guide. And, you know, I've been a faithful listener for a while. But my question is, um, why are we as non-white people so emotional? We let our emotions get in the way of logic. And, and you know, basically, as an example, you know, I'm filming a music video because I'm affiliated with a music company, and I asked my daughter, because she's a videographer, to film something for me, and she said she would do it, but then she came back and said, you know, I told her, hey, send us a sample of your work, you know, so the, the guys can see, um, you know, what, what what you're capable of, and, you know, we're all non-white people, and the first thing she said, I don't have to prove myself to this, you know, use the term, but that's what she said, and then, you know, she said, I don't want to 
do it anymore. So I, I talked to her today, you know, that was two days ago. I talked to her today, and she said, oh, well, I'll do it, you know. And I was just going through a lot of things. So basically she let her emotions get in the way of just doing something productive. So, you know, why is that? Can you give more insight into that? And okay. I'll hold on the line. All righty. Mr. Fuller? Depends on what the emotion is. If it's frustration, frustration comes from not knowing what to do. And then once you get frustrated, frustration comes from confusion. If you get confused, then you get frustrated about being confused, meaning you don't know what to do. And you don't know what to do because you don't understand what somebody else's plan is when you ain't got a plan or you're you're not able to execute your plan. So that's where frustration sets in, confusion sets in. And when you have frustration and confusion, the next thing is going to be anger. You can't stay frustrated and confused without at some point getting angry, getting mad. And when you do that, then you start doing things that, you really look back later and say, I shouldn't have made that move. Uh See, but so how do you eliminate all that in front? First of all, don't expect anything to happen in your favor, anywhere you go. That's always a mistake. Always think that when you walk out your door, you're walking onto a battlefield. Uh Mm-hmm. And when it comes to the emotions of, you know, that not feeling good about something, that's why I made that movie list uh, that's so long. It's a lot of lessons in movies. Sometimes you can learn things in movies just by looking at it in a breezy manner, what I say, you know, it's using a slang term, that reading a book, I mean, is a little bit more laborious when you can learn the same lessons in a movie. Or that's why they have pictures in books sometimes. They kind of help you along. They say, you know, one picture doesn't always work. That's just an old cliche. But one picture is worth a thousand words. So motion pictures sometimes, you pick up things. In the movie Saving Private Ryan, there are some soldiers on a battlefield. And there's one scene in the movie, Saving Private Ryan, where one of the people in this captain's unit, one of his fellow soldiers, says, Captain, you're talking about us uh, charging a machine gun nest. And we're just four or five people. And we've got a lot of open ground between us and the machine gun. And if we charge, go charging up there over that open ground, machine guns are made to shoot down people who are running in open ground. They're going to kill us all before we get anywhere near them. So, you know, it doesn't make sense, and it's risky. You know, and then he gave the bottom line after he made his little presentation to the captain. He said, I don't feel good about this. And the captain had a question for him. The captain waited, you know, for him to say his little piece. It didn't take him long to say it. Uh, He said, but the bottom line was, I don't feel good about this. And the captain said, when's the last time you felt good about anything? Now, I point out that scene. If you're black and you're on the planet Earth and you're in this system of white supremacy and you feel good about something, that's weird. It really is. If you're black and you're on planet Earth in 2022, if you go according to logic... And I'm I'm telling it like it is now. You are not supposed to feel good 
about anything ever until when? Until white supremacy ends, that's when. But then the captain of that unit was also letting them know something else. We're going to attack that machine gun there. Why? Because that's what we are here for. And how you feel about it has nothing to do with it. Because it's the best thing that you can possibly do. So, I point to that message over and over again. Mm -hmm. It's shown in a lot of other ways. In fact, people who say they believe in Christianity have seen example of that in what the preachers have said who teach Christianity. In Christianity, I understand there's a man called Jesus. And so, more or less, at what they call the Last Supper, that man that they say lived 2,000 years ago gave that same illustration. This is no real party. This is the Last Supper, like when you're in the penitentiary. They give you an excellent meal. Think about that. When they get ready to do what? Where they have what you call capital punishment. Yeah, let them have anything he wants to eat. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, he ain't going to be here long to digest it. Mm-hmm. That's, that's true. Um, Mr. Fuller, um, I, I'm a little confused here. How, how? What does that or the examples you use have to do with us being emotional. I'm missing something here. Can you explain that? I'm saying, like the captain was saying, you can have, you know, feelings. Feelings are supposed, of, they do serve a purpose, but they're supposed to lead you to do what needs to be done. Mm, okay. All right. If your feelings don't don't motivate you to do what needs doing, it means what needs doing ain't going to get done. Hmm. So you can't hmm. let your feelings... See, feelings change every five minutes, mm-hmm. if not less than that, depending okay. on the circumstances. Okay. Okay. That part I get. Okay. Yeah. All see, right. but feelings do serve a purpose, but feelings... See, the the captain, you might say, has feelings. But his feelings were saying, yeah, you can feel any way you want to, but you're going to charge that machine gun nest. And some of us just might get killed, but that is the deal that we made. Mm, Okay. All righty. Well, Delvon... Thank you for being um, new to the program. I'm glad that you have uh, a copy of Dr. Uh, Francis Cress Welsing's book. <laughs> I do, too, as a matter of fact, in my library. But thank you. And as I try to say to all new callers, don't be a stranger. Thank you. Well, let's see here. we got 32 minutes, so guess what we're going to do here? We're going to go to uh, station break. You are listening to... The Counter Racist Code Show with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. And I am your co host, Mr. Bobby. Now, for the remaining 30 minutes, you can get in contact with the show if you would like by calling this number, which is 516 453 9921. And if you have a comment or a question that you want to do, just press the number one button and you will get in line. Like my brother from Dallas, two questions great. Hopefully we can get to you. You can do that. You can also email me at the numeral 7, Mr. Bobby B-O-B-B-Y at gmail.com and I will give you a symbol that I have received. 
your question, and it will be uh, asked at a certain time so Mr. Fuller can answer it. And then uh, lastly, you can join the chat room, and they've been popping in there today. I had to look up D-E-I just to make sure I knew what they were speaking about in the uh, chat room. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But anyway, good, good questions and good conversation there. You can do that by going to blogtalkradio.com and make sure that you uh, click on programs and you will get come up with the Produce Justice Show. Click that bad boy on and then... uh, uh, the chat room becomes available for you, and you can go in and read the chats. Uh, Constructive Action Items has given a list of the things that we discussed last week, so they're there for your information, and a lot of other information, and it's good information that is in there. So you, or yeah, so it, you may want to um, adhere to that or look it up. I suggest you look it up and uh, research it and find out what's going on so that you would be in the know. And speaking about in the know, uh, hopefully, and particularly if you are a new caller, make sure, or new to the program, not necessarily a caller, but uh, make sure that you get the books by going to um, producejustice.com. And you want to get the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. There are three volumes that Mr. Fuller has indicated that people really like that first volume. I believe it's the nine. Is that the 1984 volume, Mr. Fuller? 1984, yes. Yeah, some people say they prefer it because, like one person wrote me and said, less, it's a case of less being more. In other words, the book isn't a stick. Mm-hmm. And it was back in 1984, and a lot of people have told me they prefer it because it's easier to read and they get the point. Yes. But okay. But in the interim years, since 1984, people was asking me about more and more questions that are not in the book, so I just kind of updated it. I included just about everything in the updated version. That's in the first version, so you get mm-hmm. you just get more. But okay. some people said, I pick up on what you were saying right away. Now, mm-hmm. people have said that to me all down through the years. They said, well, I understood your book the first time I saw it. And I, I began to wonder about why is this that some people don't get it at all, and some people get the whole thing right away. They understand. They say, that, hey, their eyes was open and... And they knew what I was saying mm-hmm. right away. Right away. And then okay. then people would tell me, give me some indication of why. People who think mathematically, in other words, think about problem solving all the time, they find the book easier to read. Okay. But people who like, who like uh, you know, the average person, doesn't think mathematically, cause mm-hmm. and effect. The average person is not logical. See, that's the difference. Yes, sir. People who are very logical pick up on what I'm saying very easily. People who say cause and effect, fire will burn, water is wet. You don't go by your feelings. You go by what you're looking at and what, what the effect is. You say, well, I don't feel like water should be wet. Okay, well, you're out of sync with logic there. Water is wet, regardless of how you feel about it. But people who go by their feelings will have a hard time understanding what I wrote. Why? Because I came to the conclusion they're blocking off certain truths in their minds. Okay. There are black people who get in trouble all the time. Because they, if they imagine something should be the uh, some type of way, but it's not that type of way, they'll let their imagination tell them that it is that way. Mm-hmm. And millions of black people get in trouble every day all over the world. Yes, because sir. they say, yeah, but if... If I do that, you know, uh, I get my feelings hurt. They say, yeah. 
But if you don't do it, everything about you, you know, the rest of your life is going to be hurting. Now, take hmm. your choice. Now, mm-hmm. the person who tells you that gives you that explanation. That's a mathematical thinker. Yes, sir. Say, yeah, you know, just like that captain I illustrated about. Say, yeah, but you can make a problem for somebody else. And we're here to solve problems. That's what you are here for, soldier. But just because you don't feel good about the problem that you have been assigned to solve, you're going to pretend that you have solved the problem. And that's going to make the problem bigger for everybody, Mm -hmm. including you. Mm -hmm. Okay? Mm -hmm. But I'm, I'm just explaining why some people... Yes, sir. Uh, in the back of their minds when they start reading my book. And some people have told me that outright. Oh, I, when I saw that white Supreme say, I was through with that book right now. Oh, don't, don't tell me about no white folks being supreme over me. I'm my own God. I go where I want to. I do what I please. Oh, really? All right. Oh, and that's okay. a black person who's heading for trouble right there. Heading for trouble. Okay. If he ain't, well, really, according to the code, you're already in deep trouble. If you believe that you ain't no system white supremacy, you're already in trouble. And anybody who listens to you along with you, they're going to be in big trouble. Why? Uh-huh. Because the mathematics say that regardless of how you feel, machine guns, when a machine gun bullet hits you, even though you you think that telling the machine gun, I don't like you, when that machine gun fires, the machine gun doesn't care what you don't like. Hmm. All righty. Okay. Anyway, you can get the book by going to ProduceJustice.com. ProduceJustice.com. Okay. Get ready. We're going to go up in Harlem, and we're going to have Joe. Joe, get ready for your question here. Wait a minute. See if I can get you in here. Arrow, there you go. Joe, Good morning. Hey, good morning, Mr. Fuller. Uh, good morning, Mr. Bobby. Um, I would like to stay on the line, please. After okay. Um, so my question is uh, for Mr. Fuller. If black people intend to do something constructive, is to show all to other black people, would that constructive activity still be considered as a kind of racism act? Hmm. Okay. Any constructive activity that a black person is engaged in is a counter racist act. If that's the answer to the question. Is that the answer to the question? Wait a minute. Yeah, okay, Joe, he says is that the answer to the question? Yeah. yeah. Okay. And so if a person uh uh, reason for doing this kind of racist act, the intent is to show up to other black people. Is that still a kind of racist act? If the intent is to do what? To show up to other black people. This kind of racist uh, oh, Wait a minute. Is the intent to do what? The intent to do something constructive is to show off to other black people. Did you say show off? Thing? I didn't get that second thing. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, Joe, yeah, did you yeah. say show That's off? Yeah, the intent is to show off. The co- constructive oh. activity is the intent. The intent to do that constructive activity is to show off to other black people. Okay. Show off to other black people, he said, Mr. Fuller. No, the intent for doing anything constructive should be to do something constructive that will solve a problem. That's what constructive is, solving Mm -hmm. a problem. You need a roof over your head, so you put a roof up there. Now, that solves the problem. Why? Because you needed a roof. So you went and got some lumber and put it together and put the roof over your head. And then it started raining, and your paperwork and everything, you're you're an architect. Now, the rain is not getting on your blueprints, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And you've solved that problem, and you're comfortable in what you're doing. Why? 
because you put a roof over the building. It was already set up, but it didn't have a roof. You put a roof over it, and you went under the roof, and you spread out your papers, blueprints, etc., so that you can build other things in a comfortable setting. You satisfied one of the three wants, three things that everybody wants. Comfort. And if you're Mm -hmm. doing something constructive and you're comfortable in doing it, you can do more of it. But now, you said something about show-offism. That shouldn't be the purpose for doing anything constructive. Show-offism is just to get other people's attention. Yeah. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Sir Lawrence Olivier, an actor, a British actor from the old school, said that when he was asked, someone asked him many years ago, many decades ago, why is it that people become actors? And he said, it's three words, and he repeated them three times. Look at me. Look at me. Look at me. Now, Sir Lawrence Olivier was in show business, and he says that's why people go into show business. They want attention. Look at me. Nobody's paying any attention to me. And that that is something that black people pick up real early. A lot of black people have serious problems. All kinds of psychiatric treatment and whatnot. When all it is, if you get to the core of what's causing your problem, nobody pays me no attention. My daddy didn't pay me no attention. In fact, my daddy wasn't there to pay me no attention. All right? So there it is right there. Well, what about your mother? She was always in that dish tub and working three jobs. She wasn't never there. Well, who paid you some attention? That narcotics dealer down on the corner. Mm -hmm. That's how I started selling drugs. I didn't have anybody... I I didn't have nobody to look at me. Look at me. Look at me. That's why a lot of black people want to go into show business. Yeah. More than anything. I walk Hmm. out on a stage and people are doing something none of my relatives never did. They looked at me. Looked at me. Looked at me. Oh, boy. You know, I got something that I, I never knew exactly what it is I wanted, but uh, now I, I know what my problem is. And, and the more people look at me, you know, I, I'll throw a brick through a window to get people to look at me. They'll do that for mm. a little while anyway before they carry me away. Yeah. But if mm. I get out and don't nobody look at me, I'm going to break another window. That's the way that works, folks. That's the way it works. Look at yourself and think about that. Okay. All right. Joe from Harlem, thank you. Thank you very much. And um, I'll leave you on the line since um, since you asked that. Uh, Mr. Fuller, quickly, uh, have you seen the movie yet, Hebrews to Negroes? No. Okay. No. Okay, we're moving on then. Okay, uh, we're going to go in Texas, or down to Texas. I believe it's Zoku. Not you yet, Ray. (laughs) Zoku, let's see if I can get you in here in Texas. There you go, Zoku. Well, good morning, and what is your question for Mr. Fuller? Hey, good morning. Uh, I got two questions real quick. Uh, The first one is that 
It's a follow-up question I asked Mr. Fully Jr., but I didn't get a chance to get an answer back on that one. It was uh, about the family. I asked him about black families and told me in the system of white supremacy, we are all victims and prisoners of war. Now, the question that I wanted to ask after that was, how do we go about and teach those younger prisoners of war, those young folks that come into life within that system of uh, white supremacy, how do we go about them and make them get on with the code and with the program? And then the second wait question. Wait a minute, wait a minute. Okay, was, let Mr. Fuller answer the first question. Mr. Fuller? How do you go about making people aware of the system of white supremacy? Uh, younger folks, like uh, kids, generally speaking. The codes say. Kids from zero to seven years old. Oh, the code says. It's not uh, that matter. Understanding white supremacy doesn't have anything to do with age you are. None. Zero. It has to do with when you tell a person about racism, it's like telling a person about putting a tire on a car. They either understand what you're saying or they don't. You just tell them and you show them what you're telling them. Give examples, or just go and point out what's going on. Or better still, when they ask you questions about anything, why is that boat in the harbor? Where does it come from? Why is it here? See, when any person asks that question, that's when you give them answers. That's the way to do it. If you're in Ghana, there's a boat in the harbor, and a person, any person of any age, why is that boat in that harbor? Well, it came to pick up cargo. What's cargo? Cargo can be any number of things, but it's going to be on the boat. So whatever the boat is carrying is what you call cargo. Oh, cargo is whatever is going to be on the boat. That that boat came here to pick up. Yes. Say, well, what is go- the cargo going to be this time? Or what is it now? You say, you see those boxes stacked up? That's the cargo that this boat came to get. So you walk them through it step by step. That's all you do in answer to their questions. The best time to give people information about anything is when they ask questions about it because that means that's something they want to know. People will respond to something that they want to know, not you. what you want them to have. That's what the code says. When they start asking questions, be ready with the answers. And they'll say, well, why are they taking those boxes away? Well, we have something in those boxes. Something like what? See, these are all questions and answers. The things that are produced here. Well, what do we do, do we produce here? So we produce cocoa or coffee or whatever. And that's what they're taking away? Yes. Say, what are you getting in return for what they take away? Say, well, that makes a problem sometimes, most of the time, because we're not getting enough in return from what they take away. They'll say, well, who are they? They say very powerful people who only come here to take stuff. Who are these powerful people? They say, well, they are people who don't have the correct intentions, many of them, because they take more than they give. Oh, now he's learning. And then little by little, 
he'll learn that these most powerful people are people who look a certain way that's different from the way he looks. Now he's beginning to catch on. And what was the process for doing that? When he starts asking questions. Start asking questions. About mm-hmm. anything. To start making the connection between one thing and another. <clears throat> it's going to always lead to white supremacy. Always. Okay. Always. If you keep answering enough questions, it's going to lead to that thing called the system of white supremacy. That's guaranteed. All righty. Uh, quickly, Zoku, what is your second question, quickly? Yes, quickly, my second question will be, uh, uh, what is, according to Mr. Fuller Jr., if he may, what is a Jew? Like, what, what, what can he describe as a Jew? Or if okay. he has a statement about them. That's all. all Thank right. you. All right. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Now, I want to make sure I get this question correct. The question is, what? Uh, Zoko, what, is, what did you ask? What is, what no, is I, the I, question? I said, if somebody come up and say, I'm a Jew, uh, like, I'm confused personally because I don't know what that is. Mm-hmm. So I'm trying to ask Mr. Foley Jr. if we can elaborate on somebody saying, yo, I'm a Jew. Okay. Mr. Fuller? Oh, that's that, that's an easy one. That's right in the code. I mean, it's right in your face. And I said the same thing over and over again, but I'm going to say it again. When anybody asks you about anything that sounds like they're talking about something associated with religion, that's the first thing you get straight. Are we talking about something maybe that maybe, maybe, maybe associated with some type of religion? That's the question you want answered before you go forward with anything. Because the code is very strict about talking about anything, dealing with anything that has to do with religion. Very strict. Why? because it better be strictly codified because it can cause a lot of trouble. And you don't need no more trouble. You're trying to solve problems, not making any. So you want you want everything to be pre- very precise. I mean razor-sharp precise, like you're getting ready to walk on razors, okay, because chances are you, you're getting ready to do just that. Now, that's, now, what's the procedure according to the code? You get it straight first by asking. A person mentions the word J-E-W, Jew. That's what I heard. Now, the first thing you want to know, wait a minute. Does is, does, are we going to be talking about anything dealing with religion? And if the person says, yes, listen very carefully now, you say, oh, what religion? And if the person says, well, this religion has the name of Judaism, since this is the example you're giving me. Now, according to the code, This is universal. I'm talking for the whole world now, for sure. First thing you want to know is, oh, you're going to have a conversation with me about Jews as a religion or as something associated with religion called Judaism, I guess. What is the name of it? You know, you said Jew. Does that have anything to do with Judaism? And if the person says yes, you say, hold it. Hold it right there. First thing I want to know now, yeah, we can handle this real easy. Are you a person involved in Judaism? 
any kind of way. And if the person says yes, then you ask that person the next question. Is Judaism your religion? And if the person says yes, then you've got three questions. Is Judaism the name of your religion? Get that straight first. Question two. What does your religion require you to do in all areas of activity? Now, if the person doesn't have time to sit down and talk about that, then you say, well, we will talk when you have time. Why? Why is this important? Because the one thing you definitely don't want when you're talking about any, to anybody about any kind of religion, you don't want in, in one ounce of confusion, not one ounce. If you if you got start getting confused about anything, you back off and say, hey, we, we are heading toward an argument now. And that is an absolute no-no. Because that's what arguments do. Arguments lead to confusion. Conversations lead to information, constructive results. The big difference between an argument and a conversation. And arguments lead to more arguments. Conversations solve problems. So ain't no point in talking about something that's going to make a problem rather than solve one. And then the third thing you do, the three things, simple to remember, but you got to keep track. I've repeated this many times on the air. You're talking about religion? Three things you want to know. One, two, three. What's the name of your religion? You are meaning whomever you're talking to. What does your religion require you to do? In all nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, other people's religions, sex, and war. That takes care of number two. Question number three. What does your religion require you to do in all of those areas of activity when you interact with me? And don't argue about the answers. Don't make any comments about the answers. Just make sure that you heard those answers, if you get them. Hmm. Now, I know I, I, I stretched it out, but that's, I hope that that covered everything. But we can go back over this, because well, people that's... keep asking me about religions. Yeah. This applies to any religion. Three things you want to know. What's the name of your religion? What does your religion require you to do? I don't know of any religion that doesn't have requirements. Yeah. How can you call it a religion and it has no requirements? But Mm -hmm. I heard somebody who called themselves a Christian, and I heard somebody say this. He loves Christianity. He said he called himself a Christian. So it was reported to me. This particular person, mm-hmm. he said, and so the person asked a logical question: Why do you love Christianity? He said, "Because you don't have to do nothing." Mm. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to have to do something here because we have come to the end of the show. Ray, I'm sorry we didn't get to you. We have to get to you next week, so make sure you call in. And if you call in, make sure you tell them that you're the last one, and they will uh, expedite you on up there. Mr. Fuller, we thank you. All the callers, we thank you. Sorry we had to cut the show uh, short because we are really running out of time. ProduceJustice.com is where you go to to all your books, for the books and everything else you need. Thank you for listening. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Thank you, all engineers and everybody. We hope to do better, and we hope to see you next week. ProduceJustice.com is where you need to go. Get the books. Everybody have a very good week. Thank you, Mr. Fuller. Yes, sir, and thank you and everybody else.
Go to this place.